ready to go to six. And the six is in the middle of the head triad. Uh, it's my dominant style. And uh, sixes are that style that are loyal and reliable and trustworthy, dependable. Six is like tried and true. Uh, and it, it plays out in lots of lots of ways. We're, we're in the middle of that uh, the head space, and so we're dealing with that primitive emotion of fear. So one of the first Bible verses I've ever remembered was Joshua 1, 8 and 9. Be strong and of good courage. Neither be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord of hosts is with you wherever you go. Man, that's, a, that's a really, really good verse. Why was that verse one of the first verses that just captured me? Because I'm scared most of the time. And I need to be reminded that I don't need to live afraid. And I don't need to leave, live afraid because the Lord of hosts is with me wherever I go. Sixes are orientated to avoid ditches. You know, that's our job. Our, our job is to help the world stay out of its ditches. Um, we do it at a very personal level. <laughs> you know, where's your ditch? Let's help, let's help you get out of the ditch. That's that's what sixes, sixes want to find the middle of the road because if you get too far out there, it just gets too scary. So we like tried and true. You know, like I love praying the prayers of the early fathers and mothers of the church. I figured, hey, if it worked for them, that's a try, you know, and it's John Chrysostrom's prayer, I'll pray that prayer. That's been around since the fourth century. That, that seems tried and true to me. So I love praying those prayers of the early mothers and fathers of the church. We tend to be traditionalists. We tend to be, um, we can be pretty tenacious when we want to go about something. Sometimes we can be the devil's advocate. But our demeanor is pretty steady and dependable and reliable. When I pastored in the south suburbs of Chicago for 20 years, um, people loved it if I showed up for a crisis. In fact, I got called for a lot of crises. And the reason was sixes usually don't overreact. A lot like fives, very deliberate, uh, not a lot of emotional drama in their life. And, uh, they, you know, they kind of assess cognitively because they don't get caught up in all the emotion of the crisis. They assess cognitively. And then usually they're pretty good at that. And they say, well, let's do this one thing. Let's do this. And it kind of makes our way through the crisis. So sixes think it's good to be reliable and dependable and trustworthy. That's all kind of the resourceful dimensions of the six. Now, if this, that gets on steroids, you exaggerate that. You exaggerate loyalty, you exaggerate reliability, you exaggerate tried and true, you exaggerate that which is traditional and that which is old, and that which is time-tested. <clears throat> you can kind of get stuck. You can kind of be rigid, you can be inflexible, you can be authoritarian, you can be controlling, you can be dominant, uh, you, you, can, you can kind of be a blockhead. Um, my grandfather was a flaming six, and he came over here in 1913 as a master baker, started his life in Brooklyn, New York, got out of there, moved to upstate New York, and Grandpa was all about avoiding ditches. Why? Because he was scared. He had reasons to be scared. He's on his own at age 14, making his way in life. He's, you know, he's kind of passed those genes on. Hey, oh, by the way, if you're looking to change anything substantive in your soul, you're probably looking to change something that's been existing in your family system for three or four generations. So that's good news, because if you think it's just about you, you're misguided. There's a whole legacy behind you that's been deposited in your soul. It's deposited in your DNA, and it's deposited in the psychological stream and relational stream in which your family system has lived and from which you've emerged. And that's why it's such good news, as Jim said, that God's Spirit is just working at changing us one degree of glory at a time. Thanks be to God for that. Now, if you're a non-resourceful six, here, here's what it's going to sound like if you get two non-resourceful sixes in a room together. 
You know the Russians are all over the place? Have you noticed that? The Russians, they're really coming. Do you have your money in the stock market? That's crazy, man. You can't put... You think it's high now? Are you buying gold? You should be buying gold. But gold was at 2500 What is it at? It's only 1400 You lost your shirt in gold. Do you, did you see what California is doing? California is the sixth largest economy in the world. They're bankrupt. You know that's probably going to come to Iowa. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding you. So we got, we got the Russians. We got Trump. We got Chuck Schumer. What? Really? Seriously? Coming out of New York? City? So if everything gets a little darker and darker in the room, the six is happy. The non resource <laughs> and, and, and the reason is, you see, we're all scared together. And, and we should be. Because this is really a scary place. See, that's, that's the emotional orientation of the six. Is that the emotional orientation of the six is that if I'm anxious, that's normal. I should be anxious. And that anxiety is what fuels my inflexibility and my rigidity. And so the challenge for the six is to act with courage. That's the virtue. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's taking steps into life in light of my fear. That's courage. So I step into courage because my besetting sin is I could be scared or anxious all day long if I allow that to happen. Anxiety is something that needs to be addressed by assertiveness. Because if you remain passive with anxiety, your anxiety will metastasize. Now, anxiety, there's reasons why persons are highly anxious, and anxiety is a complicated psychological phenomenon. But in the main, what we say to persons who are anxious, begin a journey of stepping towards life. Because anxiety is an inhibiting emotion that kind of gets you stuck, and then you feel like you can't be declarative. So start acting, start living intentionally forward, start moving the ball just one degree of glory at a time, one inch at a time, just start something, start stepping forward so that you're saying, I'm not going to be defined by anxiety, I'm going to be defined by courage. And by the by, <clears throat> whenever we're looking at adult transformation anyways, we're not interested so much in people stopping something unless it's really stupid. You know, if some things are really stupid, you say, we say, you, get, you know, you gotta, if you want to get any place, you got to stop stupid. So stop stupid. But the, in, the, the focal point of living towards a transformational life is not stopping something, it's living towards something. And oftentimes in our Christian spirituality, we get hung up on our sin and we should be stopping some things. Well, you can do that all day long until the cows come home and you're going to still be stuck. Live towards what God's inviting you to. Live towards it. And if you live towards that invitation, then that which gets us stuck gets displaced because we're living towards God's invitation. So that's the six. How, how many six plus is, 60, six? Yeah, that makes oh, more. Got yeah. A lot, a lot of anxiety around. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How does this sound? Because this sound true? R relationally, sound true. that non-resourceful six can feel like a wet blanket on relationships. Yeah. Like, can't, you know, it'd be okay to have something other than meat and potatoes. No, let's just be faithful. Yeah. That's, that's gotten humanity all these thousands of years. You know, hummus? What is that? <laughs> Tofu? We're not, we're not doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, we had a family member show up with a tofu turkey on Thanksgiving. I go, seriously? Show me the meat, you know? Yeah, <laughs> show me the... Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, bro. How does the relationship between a six and an eight go? You mean non-resourceful or resourceful? 
Well, you know, the non-resourceful eight's always in everybody's grill. You know, so that's what's going on. Now, depending on the ego strength of the non-resourceful six, they can either become very passive or they can become very aggressive. Because the six is the non-resourcefulness of the, what is it, the six, two, and... Uh, um, one. One. The six, two, and one can go... I, the six, two, and one can go either way. They can either be really passive or they can be really aggressive. The, the seven, eight, three are going to be assertive energies. The nine, five, and four are going to be withdrawing energies, more passive. And the, the six, two, and one can go either way. So depending on how that parlays between them, if the six is a, what's considered a counterphobic six, you'll basically have a, you know, a cage fight Relate emotionally. Yeah, six is... Sixes can dig in if they if they feel like we got to do this to be safe. You're not moving them. Yeah, hello. You just they persevere, <clears throat> and you know they're just. Remember the Animal Farm Orwell's book. Remember that story. Remember the horse that died, just re for the revolution. That's the six. He just he died literally in the traces, working. Sixes will hang in there. When you would think, you know, give it up. No, they ain't, ain't going to do it. Yes. Well, that's yeah, good. Yeah, one of the things sixes don't like, they don't, sixes don't like surprises too much. My life, wife loves surprises. Eh, I, you know. So when you're looking at doing something, like I think persons can help sixes by saying, let's do something fun. But you got to give them a little bit of runway. Don't say that Friday night for Saturday morning. Or don't say that a week before. You know, help the six kind of think it through, process it a bit, but help them light, lighten it up a little bit. You know, what's lighthearted? What could we do for a little fun? Because like Jim said, we, kind of, we can kind of be wet blankets if we're highly non-resourceful six. You know, just, we get stuck. We got we to gotta get out of being stuck. Could, uh, like Rich said, give them time to work through the worst, the worst case scenarios thing. Yeah. And you might work through it with them. Does it seem like it could go this way really bad? Yes. That's why I don't want to do that. The, the, there's a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. It's only 0.1%, but there's a chance. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Because what you've got going for is you do have the cognition of the six willing to work kind of logically through things. And they can do that. You just, you just have to work it with them. Let them talk it through. You ask questions. Let them figure it out. And if you're patient to give them enough runway, you can get there with the six unless they're really stuck. And if they are, then the question for the six will be, what do you want? Do you want to stay stuck or do you want to change? Because some people, like, just want to stay stuck. Yes, sir. So which style is business or which style is it that seems like the conviction of our opportunity? Say again, sir. Well, I think any, any of the styles can have a sense of I'm being convicted of my own sin. Yeah, I think uh, all I, of them need to have that. Uh, you know, I got to face my stuff. Yeah. Say, say more. No, I just didn't know if there was a style that labeled that. Oh, I see. I, I, could, a, could a six label their anxiety? Yes, a, yeah, that's a, that's a really good insight. A, a six can mislabel that something is really wrong and that I'm under, I'm under conviction when in fact, because conviction can uh, facilitate or conviction, true conviction, does provoke some anxiety to make us aware. But a six has to be careful with that because we can be anxious about a lot of stuff and then we can think we're being convicted all the time and then we're really living in a very negative spirituality. That's a very good insight. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good. Yes, sir. So, if I'm really dependable and really responsible, I'm pretty bored. 
Yeah, occasionally. Yeah. How is that good for you? Well, it's not good for me if you're, if you're feeling I'm just stuck and I need to move out of being stuck. And so you figure out um, what, 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 what might I live towards that's something just out of the blue. You know, I hung around with my buddy Jim uh, Snodgrass, who was this fabulous artist. And I don't know, we were talking at his studio one time, and for whatever reason, I was saying, I. I wish I, I wish I could paint. I've never painted a day in my life. He says, start. I said, no, I can't start. He said, yeah, start. So he went and got a little stool. He got a little teapot, got an apple, set it on the stool, gave me some brushes, some paint. He said, paint that. So I did. That was about five years ago. And, and So now I paint. And it truly is amazing. <laughs> it's amazing what he's painting now. It really is. It's like, wow, that's, that's good. But I don't think you'd ever... No. Thought about that or done that or Never. taken that step without someone kind of start imagining it for you yes. and with you. Get to, get to someone who can imagine something with you. What would you love? What would you, what would you love to do? What would you love to live into? Try That's it. The, it's the question that Jesus came to the blind man. We use that a lot in our retreats. What do you want? We would recommend you not spend 10 grand to try to, you know, on the first thing that comes to your mind, uh, see if you can rent it or, you know, start small. But do something. Start something. Yeah, we, we can bore ourselves because we're so tried and true and reliable and dependable. We, we kind of don't get out of our comfort zone. And, and we need to take steps to try to do that. Now, some will work and some won't work. But that's okay. It's a journey. Thanks. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I really don't know what I'm afraid of this. I'm 100% not a social six. And it's not something that sounds like there's no hope for me. Well, that would be the non resourceful six speaking there. <laughs> Still. Well, you know, here's something we say to our. Whenever something never comes from nothing. Yeah. Something never comes from nothing. And we are such deep believers in processing our stories. And we think, particularly for persons with an exaggerated anxiety, there's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason. And unpacking, and, and that reason is most commonly, now mo not always, but most commonly located in that person's story. And if the person is willing to begin a journey of really getting into their story and, and typically seeking healing for dimensions of deep wounding within their story, they can move beyond being that anxious. But you know what? It's going to take some courage on my part as a six and your part as a six to live into my own story. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to be demeaning in any way of yeah. saying that's how the six can respond. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I, that could have been taken very painfully, and I don't, I, I, that's not what I meant. What, I, what I'm saying is we have to watch our self-talk. We have to take responsibility for that because what we're saying to ourselves is what we're going to hear about ourselves. And so can I have enough courage to say, yeah, I know how I want to respond. I want to respond like I'm hopeless. That is not true. I'm not going to say that to myself. I'm going to say that I'm a daughter of Christ and that he's working in me and he's revealing some things and he understands the story of what I've lived. He gets it better than me and he's with me. And that's his antidote for my fear. He is with me. And there's lots of times in my story I felt abandoned. Thankfully, he's with me. And I'm going to, I'm going to believe and count on that one. So yeah. i got to really work hard, really work hard about what I'm telling myself. Is it, is it in light of what the gospel says? I, I, I woke up this morning. I meant to talk to him at breakfast. I... Here's a, here's a synopsis on a retreat we do on change. 
adult transformation. The, the things that trap us psychologically are anchored in, in early wounding and images around that early wounding. The reason we remember anything is because that memory is emotionally shaded or valenced. Does that make sense? I remember things, and I remember things because they, they were either good or they were bad in, in some significant way, and it impacted me. So what is, what, is, what is in me that keeps me stuck are typically particular memories or images that are shaded with a particular kind of emotion that is an exaggerated, inhibiting emotion. And we think that we can change things by just talking about ideas. But that's not the most significant way adult transformation happens in the depth of our souls. For me, a highly anxious person, I have to create. This is the last thing when I was a kid you'd ever have me doing is this. Trust me. You have to create an image because the anxiety that traps us is anchored in an image of a memory. I've got to discover in my story what that experience was. And I bring that memory to Jesus. And I bring Jesus and the image of Jesus with a contrary emotion, the very opposite emotion of anxiety. And I see myself with the living Christ in an image with him in which I'm acting with him courageously. And I bring that image to the image of the wounding that traps me. And that imagery begins to shift neurologically in my brain, that primitive emotion. If I leave those images unattended that are anchored in my brain as images, adult transformation will be minimal. We need to create an image that has valenced within it the emotion that is the opposite of the prevailing negative inhibiting emotion. And we bring that image to the earlier image. And when I do that consistently every day, I change the neurological structuring of my brain around that primitive image. And when that starts happening, I will experience greater freedom. Because a lot of what inhibits us is biologically anchored. We are embodied souls, and our bodies carry things within them that are, need to be addressed not by just ideas, but by images. So I, I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it's very important that the image be there and not just an idea. And what do we mean by image? What, what does Rich mean by that? A what? A mental what? There you go, picture that has a, an emotion attached to it that's very real. And that's why I think so much of Scripture is around story. It's creating all sorts of images and songs. You can't help read the Psalms. You know, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. There's an image. He leads me beside still waters. That's an image. The Lord is my shepherd. That's an image. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that's an image. I'll fear no evil. That's an image. We've gotten so rational in Western culture, we've disowned our own faith. We've disassociated from that which brings the power of our faith real to our souls. We've got to get back to image. We've got to get back to art. We've got to get back to things that help us imagine differently than how we're imagining ourselves. Imagination is a big deal. And when you do, you're going to be surprised at the Lord's graciousness to yeah. you. Just don't... We're, we're going to be surprised at how Jesus wants to care for us. Thanks be and, God. and we're just, you know, and the only thing left for us to do is just say thank you. You know, because we can't do it, but our part in it is doing what Scripture says, which is entering these wonderful, powerful images. When we say the, the cross, 
you get an image in your brain, rightly or wrongly, about a cross on a hill. Empty tomb. There's an image. So we're working toward images that have powerfully soothing, calming emotions around them. Because I guarantee you, you grew up in a context that created the other. And, yes. G- and Jesus knows. Yeah. All the styles oh, have self-talk. Yeah. And depending on the, and we learn our self-talk from our family systems. We learn how to talk to ourselves from our family of origin. And it's really important as adults that we come to the realization that we have left our parents' world. Now, I have a great deal of affection for my mom and dad and what they were. He was an orphan and had a 10th grade education. My mother was from an immigrant family with an 8th grade education. And they did the best they could. But you know what? I've had to leave their world. I had to, I had to leave in part the way they thought and reflected to some degree. And how they spoke. I had to leave that world if I wanted to be transformed. And there's the part of our self-talk is around a willingness to leave aspects of our family of origin that were not helpful. And as Jim said earlier, what we say to ourselves is critically important. And what we should be saying to ourselves is what God says to us. You're my beloved child. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I delight in who you are. Your righteousness is complete in Christ. I'm with you wherever you go. He who began a good work in me is bringing it to completion. Rejoice, again I say, rejoice. Pray constantly. These these crazy things. Paul says to the Corinthians, if the Corinthian church was a football team, they'd be 1 in 11. They couldn't get anything right. They they couldn't, right? Have you read Corinthians lately? They they couldn't get anything right. Paul shows up with astounding statements to say them, and he says, if anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Seriously, Paul? Seriously? Paul is living in a form of consciousness that is just assailing that which traps the human psyche. He says, there is inaugurated in Jesus Christ a new order, and that new order has the power that raises people from the dead even the living son. He is the first fruits. That kind of consciousness, Paul says amazing things. And we can get trapped in our self-talks, but, but Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit in us has this ability to lift us out of old self-talk. But we're going to have to be intentional about wanting to change our self-talk.